Chapter 24 A cue was missed. Until now, I have told this story plainly, as it happened to me. But now the time has come for me to drop out of the picture for a while and tell you what happened as it was later described to us by Shakespeare and our other friends in London. It was Thursday evening in the Royal Palace at Whitehall, standing out in the country beyond the Strand, nearly at Westminster. All day long the carpenters had been hammering away, building the stage and the fittings which were to stand for the ramparts of Harfleur. Before they were out of the way, other men started hanging the rich tapestries which formed the background for the robes and armour of the players, and which would sweep back when necessary to reveal the private apartment of the French princess. Musicians were already carrying their instruments up into the minstrel gallery and trying to tune them in the midst of the general hubbub. Palace servants were ranging chairs for the Queen and the more important personages, stools and benches for the lesser lights who were to sit behind. Crash! Boom! The carpenters dropped their hammers and looked round. The palace servants turned white about the gills. What was that? He sounded like an explosion of gunpowder. Do you think, Her Majesty? Burbage poked his head round a curtain. It's all right, he called reassuringly. Just trying out the cannon effects. I think we got it a little too loud for this hall. He turned to the head carpenter. How much longer are you going to be making this racket? Just finishing, sir. Stage carpenters always are just finishing. The hour of the performance draws nearer and nearer, but they can always find fresh nails to hammer or a plank to saw with an ear-splitting row. They can't hurry, even for a queen. I don't think they could hurry if they were making an ark for a second flood. They stopped at last. The dust was swept up, the mislaid tools were discovered and carried away. Servants came and scattered sweet herbs over the floor and put fresh candles in the sconces. Burbage had a final look round before going to change. He noticed John Summers peering through the curtains. He seemed to be muttering to himself. Well, Summers, not sure of your part yet? Summers turned with a start, and a sour look spread across his sharp features. There was nothing unusual in that. No, Mr. Burbage, I learnt my ten lines a month ago, he said bitterly. Ten lines don't take much learning. And you know your cue? Yes, I know my cue, all right. I know just what to do, Mr. Burbage. Well, don't despise the part because it's small. Every part is important. Burbage walked on and began to dress in the robes of Henry V. Shakespeare was already attired as the Archbishop of Canterbury, he went in rather for the small, older parts, like Adam in As You Like It and the ghost in Hamlet. Happy about things? he inquired. Oh, yes, I think it will go very well. The princess is weak, but there. You can't expect every boy to act like Kit Kirkstone. No. Burbage donned a magnificent ermine robe. I wonder why they went off like that, he and the other boy. Seemed a bit of a mystery to me. Did they say much to you? Not much. I fancy they had a good reason. I'd like to know how they're getting on, wherever they are. Rub it up, rub it up, rub it up. Drumming hooves on the Great North Road would have answered him if we'd been near enough for him to hear. Hark, said Burbage. There was a confused murmur from the hall. They're beginning to come in. Not much longer now. He called across the tiring room. Everyone ready? Chorus? Bishop of Ely? Exeter? Westmoreland? Ready. An official put his head round the door and looked at Burbage questioningly. The manager nodded. A distant fanfare of trumpets, faint and sweet, heralded the approach of Queen Elizabeth. There was a last frenzied bustling behind the stage. In the hall, there was a hush. Then, the fanfare again, high and piercing, as the doors were flung back at the far end. The courtiers stood bowing on either side of the broad gangway. She came. Elizabeth, 
by the grace of God, of England, France, and Ireland, Queen, defender of the faith. Who stopped to think to themselves at that moment that of France she did not really rule a square yard, that in Ireland the flood of revolt was beating at the walls of Dublin itself, and that the faith she defended was no longer that for which the original title had been conferred. No, there was something about Elizabeth which silenced such thoughts when you saw her in her peacock glory. She came sweeping down to her chair in the front row, her immense hooped skirt rising and falling on her hips, her stiff ruff framing her face, her whole body bright with jewels and powdered pearl. She looked left and right, smiling but hawk-eyed, now graciously acknowledging a bow, now making a mental note that some poor girl was overdressed, or some man needed a wrap over the knuckles for a fault she had remembered. Sir Walter Raleigh walked behind her. He was captain of the guard then. There was Sir Joseph Montpesson, a foreign ambassador or two, lords, ladies, but not Sir Robert Cecil. As usual, he was at home, working late. Elizabeth settled herself, smoothed her skirts and signified with a nod and a movement of her fan that others might sit. There was a general rustle and scrape of feet as the court sat down. The chorus walked through the curtains, bowed profoundly to the Queen, and began. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. The play rolled on. The actors strode and declaimed. The trumpeter in the gallery sounded his flourishes. The queen smiled her approval and laughed at the comedians. In the narrow passage behind the tapestries, Burbage bumped into Summers and cursed him in a whisper. What are you doing here? You don't come in for several scenes yet. Summers moved aside, his hand in the breast of his doublet, and Burbage hurried by to put on his armour for the next scene. Summers must have slipped back immediately. I can see him in my mind's eye, skulking in the folds of the lofty curtains, licking his lower lip with nervousness. Exeter was telling the French king, Take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vast jaws, and on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans, for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. The time was near. The scene ended. The French courtiers made their exit, squeezing their way past Summers, where he flattened himself against the curtain, the chorus stepped onto the stage. The stage manager crouched over his cannon effects, alert and listening. Summers's hand slipped into his breast again. He, too, was listening for that cue. It came. Pat followed a glorious salvo of stage artillery, which made even the Queen start in her seat and the candles flicker throughout the hall. Then every eye was on Burbage as he stepped forward a brave figure in his armour. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. No one had noticed anything unusual. No one had seen that sudden convulsive agitation as John Summers was gripped in the stalwart arms of two guards and carried bodily, his cries stifled by a huge hand into the tiring room, where Kit and I were just beginning to breathe normally again. The play went smoothly on. No one knew that the most important cue of all had never been taken.